Well, good afternoon, everybody, and many thanks for coming to this, the first session of the afternoon. This afternoon's session is, of course, preoccupied with the enforcement of international law in a crisis. And if we look at the opening line of the programme, as this session is described, it says, the enforcement of international law has always been seen as a weakness of the international system. Inevitably, and I don't need to explain to everyone in this room, we are all familiar with the so-called Austinian handicap, as we have often heard it described. We understand that international law tries to please a lot of people and maybe in the end pleases no one. Maybe that is its greatest strength. We also know that many people have described the breaches of international law as fitting into the man bites dog category and that most of the time the system is enforced and works very well. How is it enforced? Why is it enforced? Why is there generally a pull towards compliance are all issues that we're all very, very familiar with. We also know that we have to be careful to avoid the so-called snap conclusion on what international law's power of enforcement actually is. We also have to be clear about unrealistic expectations and we also are more than aware of the very, very um, diverse constituencies that international law hopefully does try to serve. My name is Therese O'Donnell and I work at Strathclyde University in Glasgow in Scotland and it has been my real privilege to be invited to chair this afternoon's discussion. Our, my distinguished panel is hoping to illuminate and enlighten and there's no doubt that with such a fantastic panel we'll be able to do this. We want to do a number of things. We want to move perhaps discuss but move from the classical manifestations of the perennial problems of enforcement to more contemporary manifestations of enforcement issues to the theoretical perspectives on the issue of enforcement. We will be clear, careful that our discussion regarding enforcement avoids the superficiality of following the immediate or dissolving into a problem-solving approach of international law. And instead, we invite you to join us in a more thoughtful reflection on the structures and aims of our discipline as we see it through an enforcement lens. While public international law can be enforcement or correctional, can it be something else? Rather than receiving and shapeless, as it was described this morning, can it be something that is something other than an essentialized crisis, an essentialized enforcement? At the end of the day, enforcement should not be the flip side or the accessory to the crisis model. I will now introduce the panel, uh, which is my real pleasure to introduce. I introduce, first of all, Professor Marco Sassoli from the University of Geneva. Academically, Marco is without peer, having, um, holding positions at the University of Geneva and the University of Quebec. He has a long and distinguished career uh, with the International Committee of the Red Cross and has field experience in Jordan, Syria and the former Yugoslavia, as well as acting as a registrar at the Swiss Supreme Court. He is also widely published in relevant areas to this area, such as international humanitarian law, human rights law, sources and responsibility. I turn next to Professor Enzo Canizaro, uh, who joins us from La, La Sapienza University in Rome, as well as also holding visiting professorships at Michigan, Paris 2, and uh, University Paul Cézanne in Aix-Marseille. Enzo has an impressive academic profile as well, and also holds uh, editorial positions, uh, notably in relation to European Journal of International Law. And Enzo's uh, publication profile is also particularly pertinent in this area uh, as he publishes notably in the area of law of treaties and jus cogens. To my left, I'm joined by uh, Jessica Almquist, uh, who is a senior researcher and lecturer in public international law at the Autonoma University in Madrid. Uh, she's also a research fellow at the Elcano Royal Institute and has held research positions and teaching positions at NYU as well as the New School in New York. Her interests include protecting human rights in times of diversity uh, while fighting terrorism and in transition to democracy and the challenges and failures, may I say, to protect civilians in asymmetric conflict. 
And last but certainly not least, we're joined by Professor Stephen Ratner, who is the Bruno Summa Collegiate Professor of Law and our US representative, if I might put it like that, from Michigan Law School. Uh, Stephen has written extensively on post-Cold War challenges, territorial disputes, uh, counter-terrorism strategies, and ethnic conflict. And interestingly, perhaps in the area of enforcement, corporate and state responsibility regarding foreign investment. He's been a long-serving member of the editorial board of the American Journal of International Law and previously was an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Advisor to the State Department. He also has field experience in Cambodia and Sri Lanka, and like Marco, also served with the International Committee of the Red Cross. Without further ado, because you didn't come here to hear me speak, I will now introduce my four speakers. Um, specifically, Marco will be talking about the hard, soft distinction, uh, or the hard, soft dichotomy in international law and the um, issues within international humanitarian law and the United Nations Security Council system of enforcement. Enzo will be uh, discussing issues of use of force. Jessica will be discussing issues regarding non-state actors, non-traditional actors in international law. And Stephen will be interested in the idea of enforcement as moral choice um, and the structural location of enforcement uh, in uh, the, in the structure of international law. So, without further ado, I invite Marco to take the floor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I want. Oh. You want to hold it? You can well. talk there. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I want to make a case, but as I'm an academic, I'm convinced that I have to be nuanced and this will weaken my case inevitably, but reality is nuanced and we are confronted to too many people who see reality in just one way. Uh, my point is the crisis of the enforcement in interna of international law in times of crisis. Now, probably it's not a crisis, because crisis would mean that previously it worked better, and now it works well. Worse, we can come back in the discussion, but I think it never worked as well as now, but it doesn't work well, even now. And perhaps it doesn't work particularly now it doesn't work well because the rules and the mechanisms are much more developed than in older times, like here in Latvia. During the Livonian War, for instance, I learned in the History Museum that 48% of all farms were burned. I'm convinced in Syria not 48% of all houses are destroyed. So there is improvement, but simply we would expect that today there's more improvement than there is. Um, and I think it's also important to say that uh, we, didn't, we shouldn't under-evaluate international law and its respect, um, but you know that, obviously, in this public that uh, most rules of international law are respected uh, at most times, even in times of crisis. Understandably, media and NGOs and public opinion focus on the violations, which should be positive for us because it shows that international law has a force and that people are shocked when international law is violated. And finally, we can consolate ourselves by the idea that even those who violate international law recognize international law because they try to make arguments. Nevertheless, there is a problem with the enforcement in times uh, of crisis, and it is precisely in times of crisis that we would very much need a robust, self-triggered third-party enforcement system, which, as all of us know, with the little exception I come back to, we don't have. And we don't 
have it, this is very regrettable because it is precisely in times of crisis that the normal ways how international law is implemented and respected based on soft uh, pressure, uh, common interest, uh, reciprocity, and so on, do not work uh, properly. But states do not want to have, and I would say even the public at large, do not want to have an efficient third party enforcement in times of crisis and precisely in times of crisis because they do not want to accept ex ante before a crisis is uh, coming up uh, systems which make sure that their legal obligations are respected in times of crisis. They want to keep a freedom of not respecting rules, unfortunately, sorry. Now, on a theoretical level, um, for instance, Articles 40 and 41 of the Articles uh, by the International Law Commission on State Responsibility, which are very soft survivors of the great idea of scholars that there are state crimes, even those very soft survivors do not really work in practice. Think about the US invasion in Iraq. They were clearly not respected, not even by those states which considered that this was unlawful and was an aggression. And even for the annexation of Crimea, uh, some states often selectively have invoked those rules, but it doesn't work as it should. And to take another somehow related rule, the famous Article 1 common to the four Geneva Conventions, the obligation of all states to respect and ensure respect. And obviously the, now the US denies that this means that you have to make sure that other states respect. But even those who agree with the interpretation of the International Court of Justice of the Security Council uh, that this is what is meant as an obligation, it is an illusion. States do not feel obliged to ensure respect. Sometimes they choose. It is a right, but unfortunately as an obligation, it doesn't work. And remaining within uh, international humanitarian law, to give a practical example, it is depressing how at the last international conference of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, Switzerland and the ICSC suggested a very soft, really, I criticized it before because I said it's too soft, it's useless, but states mechanism, a kind of treaty body for international humanitarian law, as we have it in human rights law, in environmental law, in so many treaties, and states did not want it. Perhaps, why do don't they want it? What they have accepted in much more robust ways in other branches of international law, perhaps because precisely international humanitarian law applies only in times of crisis. Now, if my analysis uh, is correct, it is even more astonishing, at least for me, that one mechanism is taken serious, the Security Council, and that it is possible to adopt through the Security Council enforcement measures which are much more respected by states than uh, all other measures, although we have to be conscious that states could without any problem evade Security Council decisions and simply boycott them. But 
Perhaps, and I'm one of the first critics of the Security Council, but nevertheless, we should not eliminate it too easily because it's the only thing we have for enforcement, the only thing which very selectively, but works. Perhaps it works because it's very little governed by the rule of law. And this brings me to what could be the solution for the enforcement crisis. In my humble view, the solution is not to create new mechanisms. Also, there are some fields like in the Paris Protocol, they have, for something which is a real crisis, uh, devised very interesting enforcement mechanisms. But us states and public opinion and public opinion do not want to have a real efficient enforcement uh, mechanisms. Probably we should um, start at another point, which is to create among states and in public opinion an atmosphere of the rule of international law. And an essential aspect, in my view, of the rule of international law is to accept that legal rules must be respected even when you don't like the result. And even if you personally think the result is not just. Obviously, there must be limits to that. Mm, I'm not a total positivist. But nevertheless, a minimum of rule of law means that you don't choose, in every case of application, whether you want to apply the law or not. The, the rule of law is governed by the principle that you respect rules. And there, I think, there's also uh, a role for us as European Society of International Law and for us as academics and as international lawyers. I think it would be important that we do not, each time we consider, say, that a certain result is desirable, but it is contrary to international law, let's not claim that it is in conformity with international law. And I will shock some of you if I say that I think there are good reasons um, why Crimea should belong to Russia, but there are no reasons in international law. I mean, you cannot base it on international law. And so international lawyers should not try to find a legal reason, but say international law. As international lawyers, we should defend international law. International law says no, but personally I think blah, blah, blah. And this is not simply for others, but I include myself. I mean, um, those who work on human rights law and humanitarian law should not too easily simply say, this is a violation of humanitarian law because we don't like it, what happened. This weakens the rule of law and weakens the possibility to get an atmosphere of a world governed by the rule of international law. And therefore, to give a last example, even those of you who may have a certain understanding that Palestinians kill Israeli settlers should not claim that settlers are legitimate targets under humanitarian law. They are clearly not. Thank you. So, thank you, Therese, for giving me the floor. Thank you for your illustrious introduction, which I don't deserve, and which rather seems to put on my shoulder more responsibility that I'm ready to assume. Anyway, just as a disclaimer. Uh, the issue I want to raise is the relationship between enforcement and force, which seems a worse game. It is not. It's an exercise in legal logic and also an exercise in using practice, international law practice. Uh, 
And the issue which I want to raise, in, which probably will be the, my, only my only valuable contribution to this debate, is the following. Can we really conceive, in terms of, yes, legal theory and effectual doctrines, can we really conceive of a legal order where force cannot be used as a means to secure the effectiveness of international obligations? This is the problem. Is that a legal order? Not obviously in national legal orders, force is normally used in the service of the law. In international law, it is not possible to detect the combination of a number of rules, the general prohibition of the use of force, uh, the conferral to the Security Council of the power to use force, but only to maintain and restore international peace and security. And the combination between these two rules mm, points to a system where uh, we have no rule of law. We may have the rule of peace, but not the rule of law. Uh, and the rule of peace is not the same thing as a rule of law, even less a rule of justice. Rule of peace means that peace is the paramount, the overarching uh, value of the international legal order. And the normativity, the effectiveness, but also the normativity of every other obligation, including those which are considered as the fundamental obligation from common concern of mankind and so on and so on, seems to be devaluated in situations where the peace is at stake, the peace and security is at stake. This is the big problem uh, which we have uh, when we deal with the effectiveness and normativity of international law. In an interesting discussion we had at lunchtime with some colleagues from the Far East, we, uh, we asked the question about the effectiveness and the effectivity of a purely normative legal order, such as the European legal order. Of course, in international law, things are a little bit different. But the same issue arises. Can we conceive of a legal order where force cannot be used as a means for securing the compliance with international obligations? And in my view, and this is also a, a thread of reflection which unfolds along my writings, in my view, the entire recent history, recent history after World War II of international law, is an history of tension between these two uh, ideas, ideals, uh, systems, utopia and realism. Can we have really an utopian system which reminds to some of us, you know, the Kantian perpetual peace of a legal order where force cannot be used as a means for securing compliance? Or must we come to terms with the harsh realities of the international relations. And my obvious answer I cannot explain in full, but um, if the debate will permit when I will retake it, is that sometimes uh, realism will disprove the, the realistic. You know, reality proves to be uh, more ideal than the realistic. Anyway, uh, let me see what states did in the post-war II to assert an embryonic system of enforcement through the use of force. Of course, they try to use the few means they have at their disposal, you know, to narrow the uh, prohibition of use of force and to expand the exceptions to the use of force, in particular self-defense. A turning point in this history is represented, in my view, by the great crisis struggling across the turn of the century. Uh, in this period, we had a lot of interesting uh, development in international law. Uh, first of all, let me say that this development has been uh, boiled down, yeah, precisely in the articles on state responsibility, which uh, Marco uh, Sassoli uh, mentioned just a few minutes ago. The articles points out a uh, complete set of rules of enforcement for what concerns compliance with the fundamental rules, fundamental values of the international community. Article 41, of course. But also Article 54. Article 54 is the one which says all the rules on international responsibility have 
uh, don't prejudice the, 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 the competence of the United Nations organs. So, um, in a certain sense, um, alluding to the fact that the powers of the United Nations can be used not only to restore peace, but also to secure uh, international obligations, the compliance with international obligations. And uh, everybody is well aware that the system, even as Marco said, did improve to be efficient, in particular, in particular, and this I will return in a few minutes, yes, still, well, five minutes still, no. uh, in particular, uh, when the Security Council tried to exercise its powers in a way to secure compliance with fundamental values of the international community, and we have notable examples, of course, everybody knows, but then, uh, these activities have been unilaterally performed and the results have been catastrophic. Well, this was the premise of uh, an inquiry into more recent events. And the question I would like to ask is whether all this has changed with regard to the rise of terrorism and with regard to the need to combat terrorism. And this is also the second part of my presentation, and it's also one of the aim, if I, if I uh, am correct, one of the aim of this panel. Uh, let me say that, in my view, something has changed, but not much. And the little which has changed has not changed for the good, not necessarily for the good. In a few minutes, I can just point to two issues which seems to me of focal importance in this regard. First, what has changed on the individual use of force, on the legal regime of individual use of force? Well, I share the prevailing opinion that nowadays state seems to admit even more largely that individual use of force can be used in self-defense against terrorism, and in particular against non-state actors. I don't want to invade uh, a, a ground which <laughs> pertains to uh, the subsequent uh, intervention, but let's assume that this is true. But the question is, if we assume that this is true, is self-defense the most appropriate way to combat terrorism? And the answer is no quite straightforward, for three reasons which I offer to you without dwelling on them for any longer. First, territoriality. Recent practice seems to show that states do admit use of force and self-defense against ter terroristic entities, but only against the territory controlled by that entity. So, self-defense still seems to be uh, strictly connected with the territory. The Belgium letter to the Security Council is quite clear in this regard. We act in collective self-defense after the Paris terroristic attack, but we can act only against the, not ISIL, which is, would be uh, European Society of International Law, but against the ISIL, or ISIS, <laughs> and against the territory, against structures and the organs of ISIS or ISIL, in the territory controlled by ISIS or ISIL. Second, are we sure that self-defense is the most appropriate means to create permanent conditions of security? I think that the current events in Syria disprove this assumption. You cannot attempt to create permanent conditions of security in quite major situations of crisis, in quite complicated situations of crisis, simply because self-defense responds to individual impulses of the states, and therefore we cannot, we presumably will not, through self-defense, create a balanced situation in which collective and universal values are effectively respected. And the third, uh, backlash of self-defense as a means of enforcement, and in particular uh, against non-state entities, lies in the fact, in my view, that it seems to, uh, to deepen the still existing asymmetry between use of bellum and use in bellum. 
just let me mention that if there are curiosity on this point, I can return, or others in this panel can return on the, on, uh, on the topic. But more disquieting appears to me the changes which have occurred on the institutional plane. And I will explain briefly uh, these changes by referring to a comparison between resolution uh, 2249, the resolution on Syria, and the uh, resolution 1973, resolution which authorized the use of force in Libya. Resolution 1973 did authorize the use of force. This laid down clear objectives did indicate a territorial scope of the action. Then things went in an uncontrollable way, but at least the, re the reading of the resolution shows that the, that the Security Council did a serious attempt to determine precisely what was the purpose of the use of force. That means secure compliance with humanitarian rules, let's say, so broadly saying. Resolution 2249 does not authorize force, does not establish clear objectives, does not determine any possible territorial scope of the military action. I'm afraid that my 10 minutes are going to expire, and I just want to ask a rhetorical question about the, the many doubts which insist on that resolution. The resolution did not authorize force, we said that, but seems to tolerate unilateral force. And Oh, I was convinced that only 20 seconds, it was just to, to conclude. Uh, resolution 2249 uh, seems to indicate that for unilateral force is tolerated. It's not the first time in history, there are other notable examples, but this is the first example in which the uh, Security Council, a resolution of the Security Council, seems to admit that a plurality of states can use self-defense, each one according to its own uh, strategic views and according to its own system of values and interests. So the rhetorical question which I would ask, and which will be, let's say, not, certainly not the conclusion of a speech, but maybe the start of a new debate, is whether we are going toward a system where uh, force can be used as a means of compliance with international law only under this quite worrisome aspect. Unauthorized force, but tolerated force by the Security Council, probably because the Council is in a situation in which not more can be done uh, from a political perspective. Thank you, Teresa. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, uh, I'm really grateful for having been invited to this panel and to share my views on enforcement of international law with such uh, excellent scholars. Um, what is my contribution here today? Well, I'm focusing on uh, atrocity crimes in armed conflicts and the kinds of responses we are giving to these uh, atrocities. Um, in particular, I'm interested in, and this um, conference is uh, devoting a lot of time and energy to this problem of terrorism, but I find it interesting in this context because it really um, provides an exception to the general rule that very little is done in armed conflict to protect civilian populations or to curb massive violations of international law, yet in relation to terrorism, there is a great deal of energy and resources being spent there is a political will that is not seen in relation to the crimes perpetrated by other actors. Um, let me say something first about uh, why we call or why we would define armed conflict as crisis. In the opening discussion yesterday, uh, we heard one definition, which was the Oxford uh, definition. I am inclined to use the Cambridge definition. Now there is a lot of different meanings and understandings of what the crisis consists of. But I think it well captures uh, some of the key aspects of, of armed conflict and why present armed conflict must be considered as crisis. 
Uh, three characteristics is uh, great disagreement, confusion, and um, human suffering. There is a uh, great disagreement because uh, that was the origin of the conflict, right, between different actors within a state. They disagree on fundamentals. There's no peaceful means to solve the problem. And in the end, people take up their arms to defend their uh, convictions about the way the state is going to be run or whatever. Um, this means, of course, that the law breaks down in such uh, scenarios. Uh, this leads to a lot of confusion, confusion about what is the applicable law. There is no communication channels anymore, just information about what's going on, both for the people inside the conflict but also for people outside. It's very difficult to get around or understand what is going on and leads uh, accentuates the sense of confusion. But perhaps most importantly is the tremendous amount of human suffering in present armed conflict, uh, often leading to full-blown humanitarian crisis. Uh, it's true that according to data, um, the number of armed conflicts has declined since 2008 um, from 63 to 42 armed conflicts. This is always a matter of debate, how many conflicts are actually around because we disagree about how to define them and uh, apply this uh, criteria. But uh, meanwhile, and this is more important for, to me, the violence against civilians uh, or the violence in general ha has escalated tremendously from 56,000 casualties in 2008 to uh, 180,000 casualties in 2014. Uh, last year, there was a, some kind of improvement in these numbers, but uh, at the same time, situations such as Afghanistan and Iraq actually worsened in terms of casualties. Uh, now, um, there is this uh, statement and claim, which is very important for us uh, international legal scholars to bear in mind, and that is that 90%, give and take a few percent, actually, uh, of these casualties are civilians. Now, we all know that this is, not, uh, this is not allowed. This is a violation of international law. I mean, if you uh, kill uh, civilians. Now, what's the role of international law in this context? What impact does it have? Does it have any impact? Um, first of all, uh, let me just remind you, you all well aware of that, but international humanitarian law only for internal armed conflict, which is the great majority of conflicts uh, happening today, uh, is limited to first order prohibitions, let's say prohibition against torture, prohibition against deliberate acts against civilians, etc. But there are no mechanisms, no procedures because of this uh, enormous reluctance on the part of states wanting to see these armed conflicts actually as internal affairs. And the only rule related to the role of outside actors within the international humanitarian law related to internal armed conflict is. Uh, precisely the rule of non-intervention by foreign powers. So that's the sort of scenario. Now, we have matured and we now consider lots of branches of international law uh, being applicable in this context, so international uh, human rights law, international criminal law, and they provide, these branches do provide mechanisms in the sense of international courts, but these courts do very little in terms of making a difference on the ground in ongoing conflicts, uh, trying to curb or induce these actors to comply with international law. The law of state responsibility also doesn't provide any such possibilities, although it gives us a vocabulary and a sense of duty in, in times of flagrant and systematic violations that is actually necessary to do something. It's not just a matter of discretion or uh, political, uh, now I'm actually challenging you, political choice to intervene or try to do something to make this problem go away. Uh, the role of the Security Council is, of course, extremely important. Uh, increasing hope is placed uh, on this body for some incredible uh, f paradoxical reasons because you always distrusted this body and now yet we actually try to, to, to rely on it and we try to persuade it to do things uh, and the five permanent members. Now they have started to do something in relation to protection of civilians actually since 1999 
in terms of, uh, uh, well, first of all, laying down some kind of ground rules for protecting civilians, but above all, extending the mandates of UN peace operations uh, so that they can actually provide both armed and non-armed protection. And so, um, use of force to defend civilians in situations of imminent threat and uh, also to promote uh, criminal justice. But given the scarcity of resources, etc., in the end, not uh, so much is being done. And now, finally, I arrive to the point about counterterrorism, because it does provide a, a, an incredible exception to this rule that um, nothing, even though we now have the responsibility to protect doctrine and we are trying to convince the Security Council about doing something because it's the only organ we have. There is still a sensation and reports from the UN saying that uh, impunity is widespread in armed conflicts. Uh, armed actors risk nothing, committing massive violations of international law. Uh, in relation to uh, counterterrorism, uh, there, was, uh, there are some advantages uh, in the sense that there was already a global counterterrorist regime. I call it like that. I think it has rules and procedures and committees and whatever. And uh, this uh, counter-terrorism regime had, had already developed some basic objectives, some basic uh, ground rules for conducting uh, UN-led uh, fights against terrorism by uh, sanctions, as we all know, or, uh, targeted sanctions in the form of asset freeze, arms embargoes, and travel bans. Uh, and what was happening when these uh, terrorist groups, the new terrorist groups, or the ones that had uh, originated from Al-Qaeda, uh, when they uh, proliferated, such as the Islamic State, Al-Shabaab, or Boko Haram, uh, there was already something to hang on to. And the more important thing is that terrorists and the terrorist groups are seen as a common en enemy, two states. So this is a very big difference from trying to intervene uh, against the will of a state, you more or less have the consent, I would say, because it's a common enemy. And even if some states actually would agree that, or would disagree on that point, they can't do it openly. And that, that is already saying something, telling us something about the way in which terrorist groups are considered as outcasts uh, in international society, and actually a lot of measures, including use of force, can be taken against uh, these groups by and removing the threat by killing them. And this is quite a striking development and very, not so much critique, I would say, has been mounted against it so far. Um, so, <coughs> we have the sanctions and then uh, we extend this global counter-terrorism regime, or we try to start talking about the use of force as part of this regime, or relating to this idea, which hasn't been done before. Of course, there had been use of force, but it hadn't been done in a UN Council resolution to say that it should be tolerated, more or less. In fact, uh, Resolution 2249 doesn't authorize, but it urges states to take military action against terrorists. Um, not only the Islamic State, though, also Al-Shabaab. Uh, that, that, that one is an interesting case, less debated in this context. But there is an African Union mission in, in Somalia. And uh, in 2013, uh, the, the Security Council actually authorized this mission to uh, uh, maintain its deployment. And in 2015, it mandated uh, the, the, the mission to reduce the threat uh, posed by al-Shabaab by countering, uh, by continuing conducting military operations, offensive operations. So there is a clear uh, sort of delegation or actually authorization on the part of the security camps in relation to this organization. Boko Haram, another uh, terrorist group that is uh, operating, exploiting armed conflicts. Uh, here um, we have a multi-dimensional joint task force which is conducting uh, military operations against uh, this terrorist group. In this case, um, the Security Council, uh, to the best of my knowledge, has decided not to authorize uh, this uh, endeavor, but simply commending uh, its forceful actions against this group. Now, 
What are the implications of this kind of development uh, set by the fact that there is quite a lot being done in relation to counter-terrorism uh, activities, of course, leaving aside the question whether these activities would uh, be effective, because I personally have a lot of doubts about that. Uh, we have a, a tendency in international relations to look for short-term victories to gain votes, but then, in the long run, these terrorist groups, uh, by using force, will only antagonize them and perhaps uh, receive more uh, support by people who suffer in these conflicts and have nowhere to go. Um, implications for a general theory of enforcement of international law on, in the light of what is going on. Um, enforcement is incredibly selective, is political, is driven by uh, very sort of strategic interests and is driven by a sense of finding a common enemy. Of course, the agreement that we have hides a great disagreement, a greater disagreement, about the way in which state authorities also commit and um, perpetrate atrocities or rebel groups or dissident groups that we might actually support. So, selective enforcement, and this is of course totally contradictory to the rule of law in international relations, there is no equality in terms of protection of civilians, in terms of accountability. It will also, and this might be more controversial, I think that uh, all these activities could serve to increase violence uh, in these societies. There is already human suffering, and by um, now conducting all these mil military operations uh, in a sort of uncoordinated way, hiding this big disagreement between major powers involved in this conflict, could increase uh, human suffering. And that has been said by the Human Security Report that all armed conflicts that are internationalized tend to become more lethal. Finally, I think there's a great deal of confusion. And perhaps instead of reducing that confusion and access to information and the rule of law and information about applicable law, uh, perhaps the Security Council and us legal scholars are uh, succeeding in adding to the confusion that already exists. Now, um, there is no real, we don't know the true purpose. We talk about self-defense, collective self-defense. This is a very forced way of thinking about the way and, or what is going on, because I don't think that it's really self-defense in reality, but we lack the vocabulary to talk about uh, what is going on in a more, uh, free way, no? away and, and away from the legal uh, shackles, no? let's say. And in that sense, um, I think that we risk uh, creating a broader conflict, a sense of greater crisis, perhaps by our involvement, which remains uh, very uncoordinated, very unfair and unequal and selective. And with that, I leave it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, and, th and uh, thanks to all of you for coming. It's a, it's a great a pleasure for me to be here, um, contribute to the uh, diverse uh, views uh, presented this afternoon, um, except maybe with respect to the color of the ties of the male members of the panel. Mm -hmm. We seem to be talking red when we're talking about enforcement. Um, I just would begin with a, a bit of a challenge to the name of the panel. Um, enforcement is typically seen by lawyers as sort of a narrow concept about responses to violations through coercive or at least non-consensual means. Um, I generally prefer to talk about control mechanisms, um, processes and actions to foster compliance uh, with rules, uh, and that includes mechanisms to prevent violations, to terminate violations, to respond to violations after the fact for purposes of reparation, for purposes of deterrence, for expressing the value of law, and in some cases for punishing the violations. Um, and those control mechanisms can involve both positive inducements and negative sanctions. But as we think about how outside actors are supposed to deploy these control mechanisms, um, it's critical to recall that most enforcement mechanisms are discretionary. 
They are not legally mandatory. They are not the work of an automaton, but of human beings, ministers and others in governments, uh, in real situations. Um, even the control mechanism in the Genocide Convention does not require that a state that's not legally complicit to do anything to stop or punish genocide. Um, so outside actors are constantly making choices on these questions. Same for all of the other primary rules, whether it's about whether they're in custom or in treaty, human rights, law of the sea, immunity. The decision by outside actors as to how to enforce the norm is not typically specified, but is their choice. Um, we often think of these as political choices, where domestic or international politics and power affects the propensities of outside actors to enforce, to protest, to sanction, to bring the issue to the council, to use countermeasures. And all this is true, but my core, my core point today is that both the original decision by a state or non-state actor to violate the law and the decision by outsiders to invoke and deploy control mechanisms are moral choices. And our appreciation of the flaws in enforcement um, in the international system will benefit from seeing it that way. And so I come back to James Crawford's point about how half of our job is to be careful international lawyers and half of our job is to be good moral citizens of the world. Um, whatever our views about the nature of legal obligation, there's no question that the propensity of actors to comply with rules will depend on the extent to which those rules resonate with their considered moral judgments. If they don't, uh, actors will be more tempted to violate them. And the same holds true for the outside actors charged with enforcement. Their willingness to use control mechanisms in response to actual threatened, pending violations will also depend on their sense that the violation should be addressed. If they don't respond, then the rule will, of course, decay over time and change. And this takes us to the theme of the conference about situations of crisis. Situations of crisis are special and worthy of a, a conference on its own, not only because they increase the temptation of actors to violate the rules, where the pre-commitment mechanism akin to Ulysses tying himself to the mast may fail, but also because they affect the attitude of outside actors as to whether they wish to deploy the control mechanisms over the situation. Um, we can think of crisis situations as falling into two sorts, natural disasters and those with human causes. And the latter situations, which have principally been the concern of this conference, are often characterized by, this, by the state as an encounter with evil in one sense, the evil of the enemy or the evil of perhaps hyperinflation. So when state and non, or non-state actors invoke some kind of evil and then ignore the rules, what is an international lawyer supposed to think about enforcement? Well, the conventional wisdom is clear. The answer is, this is illegal and it must be addressed through control mechanisms. And it seems, of course, like recent history gives ample support for that predisposition. We have many episodes where states identified evil acts, acted illegally in response, and they seem to have gotten away with it, and we've criticized them with good reason. U.S. torture in response to 9-11, the invasion of Iraq in response to claims of Saddam's, Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction, and in the views of many, NATO's intervention in Kosovo. And of course, we have episodes where outside actors engaged or created control mechanisms and earn our praise, as when South, Af South American states were criticized for torture, or even international criminal tribunals with Rwanda and Yugoslavia and the ICC. In those cases, enforcing agents did not let the claimed crisis or the state's justification based on responding to evil prevent the imposition of controls, uh, whether or during the illegal acts or afterwards. At the same time, the lawyer's answer contains somewhat of a self-contradiction. On the one hand, evil is clearly a slippery concept. Think of Reagan's evil empire or Bush's axis of evil. And lawyers should not accept a state's invocation of evil as, a, as an excuse to violate the law or as an excuse by others to refuse to enforce the law. On the other hand, some things like torture really are evil. And lawyers should ensure that the law creates mechanisms to punish those sorts of evildoers. So times of crisis are special because even though both the violating actor and the outside actors might accept the basic morality of the rule as a good thing to observe in general, they might well see the crisis as the exception when violation of the rule or toleration of the violation by outsiders is the morally superior uh, thing to do because of the evil that they perceive they are confronting. Um, in philosophical terms, the analogy is the difference between rule consequentialism and act consequentialism, where the latter requires us to choose more rules that will be best for all, even though we acknowledge that there are situations 
um, where morally we may need to violate the overall general rule. Now, as a matter of international law doctrine, international law excuses violations of the rules only in a very, very narrow set of cases of necessity. Uh, we might call this the myth system of international law. But of course, the operational code is much different. States tolerate violations of rules in many situations. Now again, some of those are because the states are too weak to do anything about it, and we don't want to morally approve of those sorts of failures to enforce, um, and they're simply about power differentials. But in some, as I say, of these situations, the decision or discretion not to enforce or use control mechanisms is based on a moral assessment. And indeed, I would argue, it can be indeed morally justifiable or even morally mandatory. So we face an issue of both description and prescription. The descriptive question is, are control mechanisms less effective when the state is acting in a situation of crisis? And all things considered, the answer, I think, is yes, both because the outsiders will defer to the state more, and because if they try to deploy control mechanisms, the state is likely to resist them. But as for the normative question, should control mechanisms be deployed in these, situa in these emergency situations the same way? Well, sometimes yes and sometimes no. It's a complicated moral calculus. Yarna Petman wrote an excellent piece in the Fetrif for Koskinyemi a, a number of years ago saying that states invoke evil when they don't want to compromise and when they see obedience to the law as a form of compromise. And again, the implication here, consistent with the conventional wisdom that I've just explained, is that lawyers should not let the claim of evil stop outsiders from deploying control mechanisms to respond to violations. But I would argue that the compromise is a far more complex issue, and that fidelity to the law in the face of evil can represent a moral compromise or even a moral failing. Some examples. In 1960, when Israel kidnapped Adolf Eichmann in violation of international law, the tacit approval of that operation, as seen in the wording of the famous Security Council resolution, suggests that states saw fidelity to the law as far less important than the punishment of evil. And I think many of us uh, would agree with their assessment at the time. Um, those who opposed the intervention in Rwanda in 1994, or any a proposed intervention in Rwanda in 1994, based on the illegality of unauthorized humanitarian intervention, were, in my view, making a moral compromise with evil even if they were right that it would be a grave moral problem if we generalized a right of humanitarian intervention. And moreover, if a state had volunteered to, to intervene, then enforcement of the law against humanitarian intervention through sanctions against that state would, in my view, have been morally unacceptable as well. If a state is facing a financial crisis and is trying to respond to the evil of massive poverty and decides to reorganize its economy in violation of all of its BIT commitments, the investor who seeks to enforce the BIT and get payment in that situation might also be complicit in evil. But let's not generalize too much here. On the other hand, enforcing the law in the face of the claim that its violation is justified as a response to evil can just as easily be morally compelled. When the Israeli Supreme Court in the targeted killings case said of suicide bombers, who many Israelis would clearly consider evil, that, quote, God created them as well in his image, Justice Barak was saying that it was morally required, even in facing evil, for the state to comply with IHL. And when outsiders tell states not to torture, despite the claim that the victim might be about to commit evil, or has committed evil, those claims are, in fact, morally uh, compulsory. But these are moral choices by states. Um, so does the lawyer have any business in making these choices or advising governments, international organizations, or NGOs who are deciding whether to deploy various control mechanisms? Well, of course she does, because the lawyer has a special competence in these situations, even if the final choice represents a rest with the policymaker. The lawyer, in my view, has an expertise in four areas. First, the lawyer can decide whether there are certain violations of international law that are so bad that we would not allow the invocation of evil or crisis to justify the violation or to abnegate the outsider's responsibility to respond. This is the essence of a use Kogan's norm. We just don't allow evil or any other excuse to justify the violation, and outsiders should invoke mechanisms for the termination, non-repetition, or reparation of the violation. 
Secondly, the lawyer has expertise on what the existing mechanisms permit or in rare cases actually require outside states to do. Thirdly, the lawyer has expertise on how to invoke the procedures for using these control mechanisms in a lawful and effective manner. And fourth, the lawyer has expertise on the systemic consequences if states decide not to enforce the rules in a particular instance, because to do so would be morally objectionable. So the lawyer needs to, in my view, recognize, even embrace, that decision makers will rarely, but nonetheless sometimes, conclude that termination of evil allows or requires that outsiders tolerate a violation of the law. But in these cases, the lawyer also has a special responsibility. That responsibility is to prevent contagion, to prevent the exception from swallowing up the rule, assuming that states still believe that the rule is worth preserving. And th that contagion needs to be prevented in two senses. First, the lawyer needs to play a role in making sure that the crisis situation does not become a slippery slope for failure to enforce the same rule in other situations that are not crises. Um, and secondly, the lawyer has to play a role in not letting the failure to enforce the norm in one case to lead to a failure to enforce it in other areas. So more broadly, international lawyers need to think through the moral underpinnings of different rules of international law and of the decisions states make on whether to enforce those rules. I think we'll gain, a, we'll gain a greater understanding of the possibility for international law to affect state behavior if we see the connections between law and moral beliefs. International law rules that don't reflect moral sensibilities will and should change over time. Uh, we can argue about whether those sensibilities are just, whether they're just those of the West or hegemonic. We can talk about that if you want. But I think it's an escape to say that we can, we have, that we can ignore the morality. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your time. Well, I think you'll agree that those were four extremely rich papers. Um, the format that we're now going to adopt is I think we're going to, uh, I'll quickly recap and I think what everybody's main points were, I think we're going to have a little panel discussion for maybe five or so minutes and then we'll open the floor for questions which should leave plenty of time for questions from the floor. So Marco um, pointed out the paradox I guess in enforcement that sometimes there is a desire for it in certain areas and not not so much in other areas, and notably picked up on international humanitarian law. And he appealed for a new culture um, of, of uh, regarding enforcement. And it struck me that there was a wee bit of uh, appealing to the rule of law, but a kind of li little allusion to the constitutionalization, perhaps, project within international law in order to reduce the cherry picking. Enzo, if I'm right, does see forces and inevitability in international law, I think, and cannot really conceive of a, a legal order where in this way where force would not be used. However, he is very concerned that self-defense is not the appropriate way to deal with terrorism, and he outlined the various reasons for that, notably the, the tie to territory um, and the um, the unreliability in a sense, the, and the vagueness uh, indeed of Security Council resolutions and nebulousness in that regard. Jessica of course picked up on the atrocity crimes and armed conflict and I was struck by her three criteria for a crisis, one disagreement, two confusion and three human suffering and it did strike me that in her conclusion that that's also potentially a problem of enforcement, that we have confusion, we have disagreement and ultimately we still have human suffering. Um, so that felt like a, a, a real caution um, that this is a, a very live issue and definitely something worthy of discussion. And then finally, um, obviously we had the very rich paper from um, Stephen regarding the moral position of enforcement or indeed non-enforcement that we can never really escape that this is a moral choice. Um, and I was again struck um, by the, the examples, obviously, that were used and this idea of the control mechanism of, of, of enforcement or non-enforcement. Um, one thing that we might pick up on is, and I think you picked this up at the end, was uh, morality, whose morality, the, the private nature of moral choice, the unpredictable nature of morality, the shifting nature of it, and how the lawyer effectively, ultimately, I think you see the role as... Uh, Preventing contagion, I think, was your exact phraseology. So 
I invite you to uh, discuss with each other. Have I picked up common themes? Are there issues? We do seem to have all focused on the kind of armed conflict security issue of enforcement. Do you see it as a... Is, are there other areas that you think we might equally apply our thoughts to? May I make a very short remark on the uh, presentation made by uh, Steve Ratner? Uh, Steve, I agree with most of the things you said, uh, but there is one thing which attracted my attention, uh, not in terms of the relationship between law and morality, but in terms of strict law. You said, well, most of the enforcement mechanisms, of the control mechanisms, you may call, are discretionary. That means nobody is really compelled to operate these mechanisms. Of course, I agree, but uh, I find that there is uh, a certain development in the works of the ILC, and precisely in this uh, Article 41, which you know uh, <laughs> can, uh, should have made perhaps, or on which we put much more expectation, it could really feel. Article 41 seems to, uh, seems to uh, convey the idea that at least as far as the fundamental values of the international community as a whole are concerned, states do have a, a, an obligation to react. Not through the use of force, a bit clear, but through other means, lawful means, etc., etc., to bring the uh, breach to an end. That means that this is possibly, to my knowledge, the only rule of international law which really establishes, you know, that the obligation must be uh, complied with. Of course, we can discuss at length whether Article 41 corresponds or does not correspond to uh, international law, to, uh, to effective international law or not. But this is an interesting uh, uh, um, legal proposition, and I would like to ask what you think about that. I think it's a, it's a great question, and I guess just a, a you know, response on a couple of levels. One question is obviously uh, whether Article 41 represents a codification of customary international law or whether it's really, at this point, de lege ferenda. Um, uh, and, and I think you know, it, it's, it's hard to say that, that states right now are acting as if they're, they're legally obligated to enforce the rules even in those narrow situations. But I certainly agree that you know the, the the sorts of situations envisaged by Article 41 are the kinds of arguments where you know we would say that um, whatever invocation the state might come up with, evil, crisis, whatever, uh, we still have an obligation to enforce the law against that state in some ways um, if it violates certain if it violates certain fundamental rules. Again, I just come back to the counterexample of you know, the imagined unilateral humanitarian intervention in Rwanda in 1994, uh, violating Article 2.4. And whether or not, indeed, we would want to say that Article 41 is, is a positive development because it would require all of us to prevent um, you know, that, that Nordic force uh, you know, the, uh, that's going to you know, rescue the Rwandans uh, from, from deploying because to do so would violate Rwanda's territorial integrity. Thank you. Uh, I'm very close to what you uh, said, and so um, somehow, obviously, Stephen, what you said is correct. But you could also say it about uh, domestic law in the US and Switzerland and Latvia. It's exactly the same issue. And obviously, in domestic law, we always think about a situation like the Nazi laws, and uh, although it's legal, you have an obligation not to comply with. But this is not really the problem in the international community. And by the way, the Rwandan example is wrong, because there was a Security Council authorization, but simply no states were ready to give enough troops, and therefore the commander was not, and this, uh, the commander regretted later, um, ready to uh, take robust uh, action. So, but there was an authorization. Um, now, simply my concern is, in the real world we live, our world, to my mind, resembles more to Somalia than to North Korea. If our world was a kind of North Korea, 
I would plead always what you say, that there must be a moral choice not to comply with rules, and not all rules must be enforced, and so on. But this, uh, I hope Trump don't, doesn't hear you, and I hope uh, Putin doesn't hear you, because that's what they want to hear, to say, finally, um, we have a moral choice, and then we can discuss with the Iranians, with Putin, with Trump, about what is our moral choice. But the advantage, sorry to be such an old-fashioned positivist, the advantage of law is it reduces the latitude of arguments compared with the issues of moral choice. I'm not against morality, but I would say in most situations, and let's speak about them, and our world suffers from that, that even where the law goes into the same dire direction, then the moral choice would request states, and not only North Korea, do not do what both law and morality would require them to do. And this makes our world less sure, and I think the receipt is the rule of law. I think, we should, I think we should open this up, but I'll just give a very quick response. I, I, I'm not sure you really understood my basic point, which is I certainly did not argue that states should exercise a moral choice to comply with legal rules writ large. Uh, my, my real choice was talking about enforcement by outside states and that, in fact, because the law gives states the discretion, it is by necessity a choice, political, moral, or otherwise, in each instance as to whether to enforce it, and that there's a different set of considerations that goes into play with respect to crises than others. So it's certainly not an argument to say that morally we should just get rid of the legal rules and allow states to decide as they choose whether to comply with the rules uh, in each individual situation. So, but enough about that. Um, I think I would like to invite Jessica because one of your points was that enforcement is highly selective, highly political, and I was wondering if, in mm. a sense, there is a sort of meeting point between you and Stephen because mm. Stephen sort of said, look, a lot of times this is viewed as political, but actually he sees it in moral terms. That I don't know that he is condoning that or supporting it. He's sort of describing it in a sense and saying that is what's happening. So what is the lawyer's role given that that's, in his view, the context that the... the the decision-making operation is happening in a moral way. And I think your perspective mm -hmm. is more that it's political. So I was wondering, in the light of what Marco was saying, what you think about that. Yes, I think, uh, first of all, one should perhaps make a difference between enforcement in general, oh, daily life, when nothing, not much is going on, and in crisis situations, no, which uh, is the case we're dealing with here today. And I agree with you in the sense that uh, it accentuates the importance uh, of moral choice in these situations because uh, law is a little bit set aside in crisis situations. I mean, we have said uh, on several occasions here that there is no mechanism for dealing or tackling massive violations. There is very little to take on, hold on to, let's say. And at the same time, of course, we can't just uh, say that there is nothing. But let's say that in very difficult situations, and there each case crisis situation will be somewhat different. Uh, the importance of moral choice is accentuated, or let's say moral decision making, making good decisions in situations where there is a bit of confusion and disagreement uh, and suffering. No? So in that sense, yes, there is a meeting point, I would say, but uh, I wish there was more law <laughs> to, to regulate and to make it uh, less uh, a, a black box, no? As soon as we find ourselves in a crisis situation where we don't know what to do, no? Or then we have to build on that and make moral decisions. Well, that's uh, an interesting point because then you seem to return to Marco's point, which mm. is the potential gift of formalism, really. What, mm. what, I don't know if Marco would want more law, but perhaps a law with ends or maybe smarter law. Um, so it's not the choice between doing something, doing nothing, it's doing something else. So can, what can we think of creatively where law can maybe venture where it hasn't gone before, but stop retreating? I mean, stop retreating to the UN Security Council like some, you know, 
prodigal son returning to the father that it doesn't really get along with, but it's the best show in town. And it also takes away responsibility because then we can use the fiction of international personality in that regard to, to say it's happening somewhere else and actually bigger. At this point, I would suggest opening to the floor. Um, and if you wish to ask a question, can you put your hand in the air? Of course, our roving mics will come and find you. And please indicate who you are and which institution you're from. Thank you. So there's a lady over here. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you all very much uh, for your interventions. I'm Alexandra Hofer from Ghent University, and I'm very interested in the issue of the enforcement of international law. And this is just a broad question on an issue that I'm curious about, and I would like to know your opinions on it. Um, it's about non-forcible enforcement, and it was hinted at. It's uh, what we call the famous savings clause of the ILC's draft article on state responsibility, Article 54 which kind of leaves the question of the legality of third-party countermeasures open um, as a means of enforcement of obligations, for example. And yeah, I just kind of wanted to open the debate to that topic as well. Thank you. Thank you. Another, lady, another question down towards the front here. Oh, two more. Two in the same row. <laughs> that's quite, you can both go. <laughs> Oh, well, that's okay. That's right. Thank you. Anna van Aken, University of St. Gallen. Um, I, I wanted to connect a little bit to the legal theory discussion and I think what you call control mechanisms, Steve. Um, I'm wondering when we think about enforcement of international law, um, and here I use a term from an article by Hathaway and Shapiro, um, um, whether we don't have this national law fallacy uh, because we always try to get as close as national legal orders go with kind of mandatory centralized enforcement. The UN Security Council comes closest. Um, and I wonder how far what you would call a control mechanism, what they, what they look at is ostracism, outcasting in international law. Given that this is a pretty prominent um, sanction mechanism in a decentralized system um, where you, because where the Security Council acts, the problem is not that big. I mean, the big problem we have is, the big crisis situations are those situations where the Security Council does not act. Um, and then I would really like to ask you, um, also from the legal theory point of view, how important is outcasting? We haven't, it seems to me it's largely absent from the international law debate, and I think that is a mistake. Um, I haven't seen this article cited anywhere by international lawyers, which is somehow astonishing, so I would like to bring this into the debate. Thank you. My name is Maritese Infante. I'm from Chile, University of Chile. And my comments about the, those mechanisms that are uh, uh, supplementing the efforts made by the powers themselves directly, mechanisms that are regulated. I'm thinking uh, of the use of chemicals as weapons in Syria, for example, where the reaction through an international organization in combination with the Security Council uh, made sure that a program uh, to stockpile and to produce chemical weapons was going to stop and to be destroyed. And I think those mechanisms are also applicable in other areas that could, to some extent, enhance the picture, broaden the picture through which we are looking at enforcement in international law, uh, uh, trying to avoid a, a reductive and very reduced approach in which you see a strong power vis-a-vis -vis someone who is supposedly violating international law through the use of force. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start with those uh, three questions. So, non-forceable non enforcement, Article 54 and third-party countermeasures, the possibilities offered by ostracism, and thirdly, the supplementary mechanisms in the particular example of the Chemical Weapons Convention. So I'm going to start with Marco, if possible. May I concentrate on the Article 54 debate, which I think both from a theoretical and practical point of view is the wrong debate. Theoretically, 
uh, I know the articles are not a treaty, but if we interpret them like a treaty, we would say, why did they make such an effort to distinguish an injured state and other states other than injured states if the consequences are exactly the same? Because the only difference in case of a violation of erga omnes rules, and we are only concerned about those in crisis situations, uh, Anyway, every state has the right to invoke and to ask reparation for the benefits of the beneficiaries and so on. The only difference is the countermeasures. And therefore, if this is what is meant by Article 54, the distinction between the 42 and the 48 situations does no longer exist. And also in practice, I would already be so happy if third states were at least taking lawful measures, and there are plenty of lawful measures of pressure on another state to comply with international law, that we don't have to go to countermeasures. Countermeasures are dangerous because they consist in a decentralized system, obviously, without adjudication of a violation of international law, uh, justified by another violation, and no one uh, is there to decide who first violated. You know, I have two children, I know this story. Uh, I don't like countermeasures. They always, I became an expert in countermeasures. Uh, while, um, while the measures, is this English, retortion? No, yes. Uh, this is much less problematic for international law, and believe me, a state can become very much an outcast without anyone uh, violating legal obligations towards that state, but simply say, if you do this, we do no longer um, vote for your candidates and organizations, we don't let you anymore travel, we don't accept your children in Swiss schools, and so on. And all this is without violations of international law, and it would be good if states were at least doing that. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, tackle um, uh, Anna's question about the, um, the outcasting. Um, and uh, I guess I just have two, two responses. Um, I've, I've skimmed the article, but haven't read all the, the nuances. But I, I think, on the one hand, um, you know, outcasting is something that any practicing—it's it, a new term. But I think any practicing international lawyer who's worked for a foreign ministry or international organization or an NGO would obviously be aware that this is one of the critical ways in which we enforce or use control mechanisms in a non-hierarchical system. We eventually find ways through protests and other ways of, of isolating or, um, or at least um, tarring in some way the violating actor in the hopes that they will see it, the advantages of, uh, of getting into compliance or at least providing some reparation. So in that sense, I'm not sure it's theoretically uh, all that new. I mean, I think when we think about you know, what's happening with, uh, with Ukraine, it is uh, a decentralized control mechanism uh, in response to uh, the seizure of Crimea. It's not complete, but it is a, a form of outcasting of, of Russia. Um, I think my second response would be is that I also think this idea kind of um, resonates with some of my points about, uh, about the, the moral choices that are ma made, because I think the greater the extent to which, as a descriptive matter, the greater the extent to which a state is outcasted, if that's a word, um, it tends to reflect a moral statement, uh, a moral sentiment on behalf of the outside actors that their violation was so bad that whatever crisis they may have invoked in order to violate it is not an acceptable excuse for non-enforcement. And so, you know, North Korea can claim an imminent invasion and Russia can claim that uh, Russian nationals or Rus ethnic Russians in Crimea are being brutalized or which is garbage, and, you know, or, uh, or South Africa can claim that they need to be a bulwark against communism, and the international community, whatever that means, or at least a sufficient number of states, decide that 
Um, these are such grave violations that the discretion will be used to be quite firm with respect to enforcement. And I think those were, were wise moral choices. Yes, just a quick answer. Uh, I think Ukraine is a wonderful example of the uh, of the way in which decentralized, non-coercive uh, enforcement functions. You know, uh, Article uh, 54. Um, just a uh, just a, um, a precision. I, I mentioned Article f uh, 54 in my uh, introduction, but I. What I had in mind was Article 59, so <laughs> don't, don't, don't do the mistake to, to, to provisions. Article fi uh, 54 says precisely uh, that in, with regard to uh, a certain category of rules, which not necessarily are the rules, the fun most, most fundamental rules of the international legal order, not necessarily, with regard to those rules, uh, the uh, enforcement, unilateral enforcement is discretionary. Every state can decide by itself whether to make it or not. Whereas, when fundamental rules of the international community come at stake, then things may change a little bit. Uh, just a little remark, if I may, on the possible divergence between law and morality and uh, in the analogy between domestic legal orders and, uh, and international legal order very quickly. My belief is that, of course, uh, domestic legal orders, orders are much different than international legal orders. Structurally, functionally, you, you can find many differences and no analogy is possible. Uh, but there is another difference in terms of norm normativity. Domestic legal orders normally um, can, can accept divergence between law and morality. Law and morality can diverge, even dramatically, for a non-negligible span of time, simply because if law establishes that, you know, uh, parking in a no-parking zone is forbidden, and people keep uh, parking there and nobody enforces the law, well, the, uh, the, 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 the legal prohibition remains in force. Whereas in international law, as a factual legal order, probably in the long run, law and morality tend to, uh, to coincide. And I wonder whether um, I'm correct uh, to interpret the, 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 the conclusion of Steve uh, when he says that possibly this is true for substantive rules, but for enforcement rules, this is not true. I just want to follow up on the question about countermeasures because uh, they are quite important from the point of view of uh, protection against, uh, of, against protection of civilians and um, the, the point about selective enforcement because what we're observing is, for example, um, when the UN Security Council just would not or will not uh, address atrocities perpetrated by political leaders because they have representation in the Security Council or for some other reason, which means that they are uh, politically protected. Um, organizations such as the European Union has stepped in and uh, actually imposed sanctions. They are considered countermeasures, but they are rather soft, I think, at least in comparison to the use of force. And uh, in these circumstances, perhaps I would uh, defend and promote those measures as a sort of complement possibly complementary, uh, not ideal by far, but uh, still uh, possible to defend. And that brings me back to this, this uh, problem of morality in law and the difficulty of making choices, because I do think we are moving and we are making decisions in a sort of realist paradigm. So if we are going to make contributions to this uh, area, which is really important, we need to accept this realism, actually, and I think there's a pretty much um, a sensation in the room that perhaps we have to. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, even though, for example, countermeasures are not ideal, we need to consider them because the UN Security Council, although we are quite happy nowadays if it does something, um, 
it won't always act. And so we need these spontaneous complementary actions in order to make uh, things look more fair and just. You know? Even if, again, these are not perfect or they are very, sort of not even second best, but third best or fifth best solutions you know, to the problem we face. I'm going to actually use the third question, I think, as the conclusion for our session, because it struck me that in your, your question regarding the supplementary mechanisms that might be useful, is that it is never the case that we always have either enforcement or non-enforcement. We have different pieces of that jigsaw occurring simultaneously, and, and things are trying to work in a creative and agile way. And what struck me about the ostracism point is that that is often invisible until there's a, a kind of accumulation of events theory and you can't go anywhere, do anything, buy anything, trade with anyone, go anywhere, etc., etc. And only when that end point comes does it become clear that there has been an enforcement, small, enfor small mini enforcements along the way. And it struck me that if we use supplementary mechanisms, we are not just not enforcing, we're trying to build a pattern of enforcement, perhaps in relation to a particular situation, and hopefully, ultimately, that will lead to an enforcement. And that might just be too subtle and too long a game to gain a lot of political currency. And obviously, for people on the ground and the civilians that Jessica talked about, that's quite a hard sell at times, and I appreciate that. I think what I said at the start was I was concerned that we didn't essentialise what enforcement in international law was. And I think we can safely say at the end of the last hour and a half that we have succeeded in showing that enforcement cannot be essentialised. May I just take this opportunity to thank you, the audience, for coming and for your very great patience, your good thoughts. And most particularly, can I thank my four very um, rich papers and the very erudite speakers that I really thoroughly enjoyed chairing the session. And it was a great pleasure. And thank you for keeping to time, most particularly. Thank you. Thank you.